Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk, the most fact-driven, unbiased, true crime channel. First on the docket, Lori Vallow and Chad DeBell. The word of the day is delay. More charges for a former police officer in Minnesota. A prosecutor charged in the Ahmad Arbery case. A look at the officers and paramedics charged in the death of Elijah McClain. A former Catholic cardinal charged with, you know what, yesterday a man charged with stabbing his mother-in-law. Today a guy says, hold my beer. And then finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day, a recap of all of our contestants throughout the week so that you can decide who the winner is going to be. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Crime Talk. My name is Scott Reich. For all our regular subscribers and viewers, you know that we're not in the Crime Talk studio. That's right, we jumped in Crime Talk 1 on a little excursion for work and then gonna extend it into a little pleasure for the long weekend. All right, so here we are at our previously undisclosed location and let's get started. But first, if you haven't done so, please hit that subscribe button as well as the like button to make sure that you receive notifications when we go live or put up new content. All right. Before we get started, guess what month it is? Not just September, it's National Preparedness Month. All right, you need to be prepared. You need to go to crimetalkprep.com, get your four week emergency meal supply, and guess what? You get $50 off and free shipping. Look at what's taken place in just the last two weeks. We had Hurricane Ida hit New Orleans and it made its way all the way up, not a hurricane, but up to New York and New Jersey, mass flooding. Accidents, natural disasters happen. You need to be prepared. There's still hundreds of thousands of people in Louisiana that don't have electricity, uh, don't have running water. You need to be able to take care of yourself. Go to crimetalkprep.com, get your four week, get that four weeks of emergency food preparedness, $50 off, and you get free shipping. You'll be happy you did. All right, let's get to the docket. First, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. The word of the day is delay, all right? First, the court signed a uh, temporary extension for commitment for Lori Vallow until September 8th. Why? Well, the statute requires that there be a progress report submitted to the court and although the health professionals sent some sort of letter to the court that hasn't been disclosed to the public, they are requesting additional time for Lori Vallow to stay in the care and custody of the state hospital. Next, John Pryor has renewed his motion to extend the time for motions to be filed in his client's case. What is the reason for the delay? Apparently, he claims he still hasn't received the grand jury transcripts. Now, I'm going to have to put this delay completely on the prosecutors, okay? When you charge and indict somebody, you are telling the world that you are ready to go to trial within the speedy trial clock. And one of the things that you know you have to turn over are the grand jury transcripts. Why have they not been turned over at this point, okay? The prosecutor has that obligation. They need to be prepared at the state's expense and they need to be turned over to the defense. You know it's coming, you should have done it. This delay, we're gonna have to chalk up to the prosecution. Now, maybe there's some excuse that we don't know about. The reality of it is, is that this case, not gonna be able to go forward until we have motions resolved. And if they can't file the motions because they don't have the transcripts, then, well, that's going to cause delay. Now, let's face it. Is this case going to get dismissed by something that was done in the grand jury proceedings? Unless there was something that was illegal or completely out of the ordinary, no, it's not going to take place. So this may also be a tactic for Mr. Pryor, basically to get his ducks in a row. We saw from the interview with his children the other night, yep, that's right. He's running the defense of 
His client was framed. Uh, he had no idea. It's obvious that it was Alex uh, Cox and uh, Lori Vallow who are responsible for the death of JJ and Ty Lee, with that one exception, where Chad Day Bell apparently told one of his children when asked, where are the children? Where are JJ and Ty Lee? He said he was helping protect them. Wow, that's not good. I know those kids were trying to help, but I think they just buried their father. All right, we'll see how things continue to be delayed in the Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell matters. Next on the docket, a former police officer already charged with the death of a young man has received additional charges. Former Brooklyn Center, Minnesota police officer, Kim Potter, who was originally charged with second degree manslaughter in the shooting death of Duante Wright, now faces additional charges of first degree manslaughter. Now during the stop, Potter drew her service weapon and fired. Now Wright, who is attempting to flee from custody, took off in a white sedan, crashed nearby, and he subsequently died. Now Potter, 48, had warned she was going to use a taser on Wright, but instead fired a bullet. Potter yelled, holy shit, I just shot him, as Wright sped away. In the charging document goes into detail about how during Potter's 26 years as a police officer, she received a substantial amount of training, including training related to the use of force and specifically the use of tasers and firearms. In the six months before the incident, the defendant completed two taser-specific training courses, apparently, which provided detailed and substantive information concerning the function, proper use, and safety concerning tasers. Upon completion of her training, one of those warnings she had signed off states, confusing a handgun with the taser could result in death or serious injury. Learn the difference in the physical feel and holstering characteristics between your taser and your handgun to help avoid confusion. Now, the Attorney General Keith Ellison announced in May that he would lead the prosecution and Assistant Attorney General Matthew Frank will supervise the case. Frank was one of the special prosecutors in the uh, case against uh, Derek Chauvin in regards to George Floyd. And the Minnesota Attorney General's office has also said that it's consulted with police use of force experts to determine that both second degree and first degree manslaughter charges are actually appropriate. The complaint alleges that former Brooklyn Center police officer Kimberly Potter committed first degree manslaughter by recklessly handling a firearm when she fatally shot Duante Wright during a traffic stop. Now, as you may recall, this police officer, although we now know she's had extensive training, stated that she confused her taser with her firearm. Apparently this is a thing and she was warned about that. I'm sure her defense or her mitigation is going to be, hey, not only has it happened to me, it's happened to other people, which is why they put basically a warning label here. And well, we'll see. It, there's a big difference between a taser and a firearm. I've held both, I've handled both. It's gonna to be tough for me to think that she thought that she was handling a, a taser when she fired that shot. I don't know, we'll have to wait and see. Ultimately, it'll be up to a jury. All right, next on the docket, more information in the Ahmad Arbery case. A former Georgia prosecutor has been indicted on accusations that she mishandled the investigation into a fatal shooting of Ahmad Arbery. Jackie Johnson, the former district attorney in Glynn County, allegedly obstructed police officers from arresting one of the suspects and showed favor to another suspect, according to the indictment. Now, Johnson was the first of four prosecutors to be in charge of the case, which is now in the hands, which is now in the hands of a prosecutor from Cobb County. The three men that have been charged in the death of Ahmaud Arbery are Travis McMichael, Travis's father, Gregory McMichael, and William Roddy Bryan. They've been charged with murder and other state charges as well as federal hate crimes. Now, according to the indictment against Johnson, on the day of the killing, Johnson allegedly, knowingly and willfully hindered two police officers by directing that Travis McMichael should not be placed under arrest. Greg McMichael was a retired police officer who had worked for Johnson as an investigator, and the indictment accuses Johnson of showing favor and affecting George McMichael during the investigation. Johnson ultimately recused herself from the case, 
citing her past working relationships with Greg McMichael. Prior to doing so, according to the indictment, she allegedly sought the assistance of another prosecutor and then recommended to the Georgia Attorney General's office that he should probably handle the case. The indictment alleges that she failed to disclose that she had sought assistance of another prosecutor before recommending him, and in doing so, failed to treat Ahmad Arbery and his family fairly and with dignity. Now, this is a problem, but if you think this stuff doesn't take place all the time, you are being naive. Do you think that when these calls come in and an officer involves shooting, that these prosecutors don't know these police officers? They generally may not be friends with them, but they may know generally about who they may be. They also have a preference towards the police department. That's why when there's an officer involved shooting, it should go to someone who is not working with on a daily basis the same police department that they're investigating. It's just the right thing to do. Let the chips fall where they may. And if a third party says the shooting was justified, then that's where it goes. But it looks suspicious and that's why people lose such faith in the criminal justice system when they think the system is rigged against them. All right, next on the docket, the Elijah McClain case. Booking photos have been released of five men accused of the criminally negligent homicide, manslaughter, and the other charges against them regarding the death of Elijah McClain. Now, the Attorney General's office uh, filed a 32-count grand jury indictment against these three men. Three were officers, two were paramedics who responded and suggested that McClain, who was walking home from a convenience store, that he somehow looked sketchy, but might be a good person or a bad person. That's right. They didn't know this young man. And listen, the police have a difficult job to do. Okay. Nobody is doubting that. But sometimes, and in the case of Elijah McClain, he was doing nothing wrong. He was doing nothing wrong. And we've put up these videos. Maybe we can provide a link to them. But the Elijah McClain body cam videos, he was doing nothing wrong. And these officers put him in a chokehold, and then the paramedics, with complete disregard apparently to checking the dose, and it relates to the amount of ketamine, a, 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 an animal tranquilizer, that they're going to give to some guy on the street because they think that he is resisting when he's being choked out. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, the police have a tough job, but they can't make situations where they're out creating problems that didn't exist. And that's what happened in the Elijah McClain case. I'm going to listen. There's some great police officers out there, but there's some bad ones. And unfortunately, it took a lot of high profile cases for people to look at this and say, you know what? Just like the case in Ahmad Arbery, where the prosecutors say, oh, we're not going to do anything, right? Remember, the prosecuting attorney in Adams County, where this case would have been filed originally, Dave Young, no longer the DA, but he refused filing of charges as it related to the death of Elijah. And he said he just didn't think he could prove the case. Well, guess what? The attorney general took it to the grand jury. And those citizens on that grand jury could have said thumbs up or thumbs down. And they said, charge, charge each and every one of them involved. Now, we'll give them all the presumption of innocence because they're entitled to do so. But this was a circumstance that was completely avoidable had they just left this young man alone. Well, all five of these guys turned themselves into the Glendale Police Department. Why did they go to the Glendale Police Department? Glendale Police Department in Colorado has a reputation of being able to get in quickly and out. So you spend the least amount of time in custody. At least their defense attorneys um, took advantage of that little option for them. All right, next on the docket, a former Roman Catholic Cardinal. He's back in court for what you might add. Guess, that's right. Former Roman Catholic Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, a very powerful at one time, a member of the Catholic Church who was ultimately expelled from the priesthood for sexual abuse, has pled not guilty to sexually assaulting a 16-year-old boy during a wedding reception in Massachusetts nearly 50 years ago. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's pause and talk about this for one second. 50 years ago, I get that people don't come forward on cases very often in sexual assault cases. In fact, probably the majority of them do not. And a lot of states have lifted the statute of limitations. However, when you have no statute of limitations and you go back 50 years to charge somebody for a charge where you're not going to have any physical evidence, not like a homicide case, something along those lines, it's tough. Why? Because the defendant has some due process rights to basically being able to call witnesses that may be relevant to him or to her. Uh, but when 50 years passes by, most of those people are probably dead or near dead. Memories have faded. Evidence has, has been uh, discarded. I'm not sure it's the most fair thing to do 50 years later, but that's where they stand and that's where the charges uh, are going. So McCarrick, as we stated, was the only U.S. Catholic cardinal, current or former, to ever be criminally charged with child sexual abuse. McCarrick now lives in Missouri, and he faces three counts of indecent assault and battery on a person over 14, according to the court records. Now, the tw in 2017, a former altar boy came forward and said that McCarrick had groped him when he was a teenager in New York. The next year, the Archdiocese of New York announced that McCarrick had been removed from the ministry after finding the allegation to be credible and substantiated. Two New Jersey dioceses revealed they had settled claims of sexual misconduct against him in the past, and McCarrick, now 91, who showed up wearing a mask, entered the Boston District Court hunched over using a walker. He didn't speak, he entered a plea of not guilty, and they set bail at $5,000 and told him to stay away from anyone under the age of 18. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, it just never ceases to amaze me why people in position of power, whether it be a priest, a politician, a teacher, goes after the vulnerable, the children. They always seem to do, and it's why you have to be careful you can't just trust somebody based upon their position or status in life. So I don't care who they are. You need to get yourself a background subscription service. Go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. You can cancel at any time, but guess what? You can do a background search and find out information about anyone you search here in the United States. And my guess is you're going to find something that frankly, surprises you uh, about somebody. We use this every day. We use it on witnesses all the time to see if something pops up. And most of the time, something does. Go to crimetalksearch.com. You'll be happy you did. Well, ladies and gentlemen, remember yesterday we had the man who stabbed his mother-in-law with a sword? Well, we have a gentleman today that said, hold my beer, or should we say, hold my whiskey? Um, a man who's 50 years old reportedly called the police early Wednesday morning to say that he had shot his mother, 78 years old, um, basically to put her out of her misery. Now, Glenn Gregg called the police and told dispatch he had shot his mother, Melva Gregg, and the police showed up and found a small caliber handgun that they suspect was used in the shooting. When officers arrived, uh, Glenn uh, appeared intoxicated he admitted to the police that he had consumed a big bottle of whiskey throughout the day before he shot his mother, who was going insane, according to him. Uh, Glenn's father is reportedly in the hospital, and he said his mother doesn't understand that Glenn is unable to bring his father home. And according to Glenn, he just snapped, shot Melva while she was in her sleep. The uh, police are holding him with obviously the uh, charge of uh, first degree murder, possession of a firearm while intoxicated, and felon in possession of a firearm. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I say kind of tongue in cheek that he went a little farther than the guy yesterday, but the reality of it is, listen, no matter how bad somebody is physically or mentally or losing their mind uh, with dementia or Alzheimer's, you can't go around killing them. They call that murder. Yes, they call that murder. Don't do it. Um, sad situation. I'm sure he thought it was justified, even though he was completely under the influence of a large bottle of whiskey. But 
it is against the law. You can't do it no matter how compassionate you think you may be. All right, next on the docket, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. A Florida woman, Melissa Daigle, 44, was intoxicated last night during a family discussion that turned violent when she threw her dinner plate of spaghetti at her spouse. The spaghetti struck the torso of her husband. He wasn't injured, just covered in meat sauce. Daigle was arrested for domestic battery and booked into the county jail. More food, ladies and gentlemen. There always seems to be food involved with the dumb criminal contestant of the day. All right, now a quick recap make sure you put your vote down below in the comments we will tally them up and we will let you know who will going who is going to be the dumb criminal contestant of the week what does the dumb criminal contestant of the week get crime talk gear now if you want to get your crime talk gear without having to become a dumb criminal simply hit the link below and you can order your own crime talk gear all right the recap begins Christina Revels Glick, 34, was arrested for pleasuring herself with a device on a Georgia beach. She didn't think she could be arrested because it only took her 20 seconds to reach orgasm, and she didn't think that anyone had seen her. Guess what? Somebody had. Tuesday, a man named Tatman was wearing a Batman shirt when arrested for, well, Robin. That's right, Alan Tatman, 46 busted for stealing over $500 of merchandise from a Target in Lexington, Kentucky in his Batman shirt. Wednesday, Taylor Beverly, on a first date with a female passenger in a motorcycle attempted to show off, was arrested following a high-speed chase. The uh, woman told the police she was screaming and told him not to stop. He noted that it was their first date and just trying to impress the girl. Thursday, Chloe Rozak, 24 being held by the Honolulu Police Department following her arrest. The Illinois woman was accused of falsifying vaccine cards. She was spotted because she misspelled Moderna, which is M-O-D-E-R-N-A with M-A-D-E-R-N-A. -E Little tool, if you're gonna forge a document, make sure you get the spelling correct. All right, that's the recap of our dumb criminal contestants. Enjoy, let us know which one deserves the distinct honor of being the Dumb Criminal Contestant of the Week. All right, thanks for watching. It's been a busy week. Enjoy your long weekend, enjoying Labor Day. We'll have a video up on Monday and we'll see you Tuesday. Thanks for watching Crime Talk. We'll see you next time. <music>